Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Kaplan, for those of you who have uh, not met me, and uh, I want to thank you for coming this evening and thank Fairfax County for uh, making this facility available to us. What the objective here is, is to talk about uh, a couple of diseases, two in particular, chronic pain, right, which is a great big topic, and depression and anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress syndrome, which are other great big topics. What they both have in common is that, for the most part, they've not been understood in terms of what their neuropathology was, what the neurophysiology of these diseases are. So we've got two diseases that we describe, but neither of which we actually understand. We treat them with antidepressants, we treat them with anti-seizure medications, we treat them with antibiotics. Uh, but we haven't got a unified concept of what these diseases are and how we can go about treating them. What's our target? What's our physiologic target? What makes sense of all of this stuff so that we understand what it is we're looking at? And without understanding that, we're kind of like keep throwing things up against the wall. And so what this is going to be is the first of a whole series of lectures that we're going to be presenting that will include not only uh, members, uh, physicians, and um, therapists at the Kaplan Center, but also other physicians from the community to talk about this issue of chronic pain, chronic illness, uh, depression. And what we want to do is kind of redefine these diseases for you in physiologic terms. And the reason for redefining them in physiologic terms is because when we do so, you have a better understanding of how to treat them. This is a new way of thinking about these diseases. This is a way of thinking about them that prior to the last five, six years, we have been unable to think about them because we didn't have the research to support what we're doing. So at its bottom line, what I'm going to tell you is that all of the diseases I mentioned to you are neuroinflammatory diseases. All of them as a result of being neuroinflammatory diseases are neurodysregulatory and neurodegenerative. And it's critical that we understand that because the long-term consequences of not addressing these diseases aggressively and early uh, results in long-term disability and long-term uh, real destruction of lives. So it's important that we get on these things as soon as possible, but when, as soon as we switch from calling it depression and chronic pain, and we change the perspective to that of a neuroinflammatory disease, everything changes. We ask a whole different set of questions. We have a whole different set of things that we can go about treating in order to quiet the process down. So what's pain? All right, everybody knows what acute pain is. And in fact, from a neurophysiologic standpoint, we really know what acute pain is. We know all the pathways. I can tell you from the time that the injury occurs at your tissue exactly what factors start to get uh, put into play, what nerves are going to come into play, what the pathways are going to be going up to your brain, and how the responses are activated. All right? So it's an unpleasant sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Now, this is now a difference between chronic pain and acute pain. Acute pain, we know what caused the problem. We know uh, why it got put into action. We know that it expects to heal in a certain amount of time. And we know that uh, how to treat it. Okay? This is potential tissue damage. What does that mean? Something got hurt. We think something might get hurt. And yet we're in pain from it. Even though there is no objective outward signs of that damage to the tissue. It's a complex subjective perceptual phenomena with a number of contributing factors that are uniquely experienced by each individual. All right? What causes pain in you will not cause pain in me. What I perceive to be disabling will not be the same as what you perceive to be disabling. So there's this whole subjective component that starts to come into play with this, this disease. Chronic non-malignant pain. Now we're talking about specifically non-malignant pain is defined from pain from cancer, which actually we know why you're having the pain. So we know what to treat. So it persists long after a reasonable period of healing. Uh, it may develop after an injury. Uh, it, the underlying causes are often not discernible. We don't know why you continue to have the pain. The pain is disproportionate to the amount of tissue damage. Uh, frequently accompanied by alterations in sleep, mood, sexual, vocational, and recreational function. And pain itself is now the disease that we're talking about. Chronic pain conditions include things like fibromyalgia, 
which I hope by the end of the lecture you'll understand is a misnomer. It's a generalized pain syndrome, okay? It's real, the insurance companies let it give us something to hang our hat on. But if we call it fibromyalgia, we kind of end our discussion as opposed to beginning our discussion. So fibromyalgia is not a problem with the muscles. Fibromyalgia is not a problem with the tendons and the ligaments and the joints. Fibromyalgia is a problem in the central nervous system. Uh, neuropathic pain is actually damage to the nerves themselves, and you can see that in diabetic neuropathies or post-hepatic neuralgias, uh, radiculopathies such as impingement of nerve root in the back. Uh, chronic daily headaches is a type of chronic pain, as are recurrent migraines. Uh, low back pain, certainly one of the things we see most commonly that about 80% of people uh, in the country will experience at one point or another in their lives. Major depressive disorder, okay? This is not, I'm, I have the blues and I'm depressed because I can't do what I want to do. This is actually if life were completely good and life were completely fine, I would be depressed. <laughs> things are not going well. Your loss of energy, loss of interest in things that used to in, get enjoyment out of. You can have cognition, that is problems with focus, concentration, short-term memory issues. Uh, appetite disturbances, too much, too little. Uh, psychomotor agitation and retardations. You can't sit still. You get really active, you get really hyper, or you get really withdrawn. So it can go either way. And again, sleep disturbances. So we have two diseases, big disease categories, chronic pain and depression in this case, which we're focused on, and we'll stay focused on depression simply because that's where our stats are going to be here. The other thing I want to emphasize as we go through this lecture is, is this is not my opinion. This is a consequence of a great deal of research that I've been doing. This is all in the literature, and this is bringing forward all right, a lot of the basic science literature into the clinic. And it's a whole new way of, of defining these diseases and treating them. So the comorbidity of neuropsychiatric disease, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and chronic pain are common. How did we get into this? The problem is, uh, I'm a family physician, and I'm a chronic pain specialist. All right? There's not a lot of us around. There's only 18 of us that are double boarded in the country in both those areas. Most pain specialists are also boarded in uh, physical medicine and rehab or anesthesia, uh, but uh, neurology, but not many of us have a family practice perspective. We were seeing lots and lots of people who had chronic pain and problems also at the same time with depression, problems with anxiety disorders. And we were going, why are we seeing so many of these people? And so what we did is that we convened a group of psychiatrists uh, and one of the neurophysiologists from Georgetown uh, and some meditation experts. And we started a discussion group that's been going on for the last five years to take a look at why are we seeing so much of this stuff and what can we do as a community to treat this stuff better and understand it better? And so it was out of these discussions that a lot of this research uh, emerged, trying to get a better handle on this, because we were all very frustrated. I was really getting tired of watching my patients get sicker and sicker and sicker and not recover. And so what could we do in order to get a better handle on this stuff? So when we looked in the literature, it turns out that we weren't alone in observing the fact that lots of people had this chronic pain and chronic depressive disorders, okay? And if you look in the literature, what you find is about 50 to 65% of people who have chronic pain, or 50 to 65% of people who have depression, also have the other condition, all right? This isn't rare, this is extremely common. In fact, it's more common than to have simply depression alone or to have chronic pain alone. And if you're looking at numbers, you got about 47 million people a year, 50% of the population who are suffering with chronic pain, and you've got about 21 million people who are suffering with major depressive disorder. Okay, that's, and I'm not including now in these numbers the general anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress syndrome, but it's a huge overlap. And my proposal to you is that this disease and this disease are different than this disease. All right, and that's also very critical to our thinking and our process in addressing this. So the people who have solely chronic pain and no neuropsychiatric issues, I think have a different disease than people who have both. People who have solely depressive disorders and not both disease also have a different disease than those that have both. 
So when depression and chronic pain occur together, treatment success is dramatically lower. The cost of taking care of them is dramatically higher than when these diseases occur separately. So much so that we're talking about 25 to 50 percent higher cost of treatment than for either condition alone. Disability is considerably greater when either when those conditions occur together. And in one study, the likelihood of recovery if they, these diseases occur together was 9% versus when they occurred independently at 47%. The comorbidity of these diseases is disastrous, and we stink at treating it. All right, as a medical community, we have abysmal time treating people who have the comorbidity of chronic pain and depression. And we have that because we think about it wrong. We don't treat it right. So chronic pain and depression share a common neurophysiology, neurobiology, and they're mutually reinforcing neuropathologic processes. So they have common genetic uh, vulnerabilities, they have common neurobiology, neuroanatomy, neuroendocrinology, neuroimmunology, neurotransmitters. I'm not going to spend huge amounts of time on this other than to kind of go over it. There's, this is fairly complex and in-depth stuff, but I'll, I'll get more to the concept of central sensitization, which is the co-occurrence of both these diseases. What gets these things turned on and what it is we do to treat it. But if we look at the functional MRI studies, we find that there's a huge overlap in the number of regions of the brain that are affected in depression and the number of regions of the brain that are affected in uh, major depressive disorder. And these are just some of the regions uh, that we can talk about. But again, I don't want to go into great deal on this. This I want to spend a moment on. How many of you here have been told that you have either chronic pain and that you've got a adrenal insufficiency, okay? It's a number of people in the audience. All right, there is nothing wrong with your adrenal gland. The problem with the adrenal is the disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The problem is in the brain. The problem is not at the adrenal gland. So the signaling process that keeps the hormones functioning properly, all right, and you need your adrenal gland for lots of things regulation of your sleep cycle and your wake cycle, energy, re repair, because it's cortisol that's coming out, so control of inflammation in the body, and you need it for uh, adrenaline output. So what's happening here is, normally what happens is the signal comes from, you put out your cortical steroids, uh, it goes up into the brain, and then interestingly where it registers is in two areas of the brain called the amygdala and the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a particularly important area because it's responsible for formation of long-term memories and emotionally associated memories in the brain. And the amygdala is associated as part of your limbic system and it's part of the, what turns on the emotional response. And so the hippocampus and the amygdala actually are the ones that control the production of the, uh, from the adrenal glands when all is said and done. Those get disrupted as part of this neuroinflammatory and neurodegenerative uh, process. So, what happens when you have chronic pain and when you have chronic depression is that these areas of the brain actually get dysregulated and they lose cell mass. All right? Now up until the early 90s, we thought that the brain you were born with is the brain you had. We thought it was fixed. The brain didn't grow and nothing changed. Then there was an experiment with a, a mouse and how far does the average lab mouse run in a night? The answer is five kilometers. It's an important fact to know. Why is that important to know? Because it turns out if we take mice, and we, they're very social creatures. They actually like hanging out with each other. Uh, they chat, they sniff, and they run on their wheels all night long. So they get a lot of exercise, they get a lot of social activity. All right, if we take them and we now put them in a cage, and we let one guy have access to a wheel, and we let another guy not have access to a wheel. And then we take a look at their brains. And what we find is the guy who has access to the wheel in this region of the brain, cells grow. There is neuroplasticity. The brain grows. The brain changes. This was a startling revelation. And the guy that just walked around the cage all night long didn't have that same neuronal growth. So it told us that exercise was important in neural regeneration, and that exercise could produce neural regeneration, and that, in fact, neural regeneration was possible, it could occur. 
Now, another interesting extension of this study was they took those guys and they put them in a dunk tank. So they know how many kilocalories in energy they expel a night, and you stick them in a dunk tank, and then they have to swim for their lives. So on the wheel, you get to choose if you want to go. You hop on, you hop off, you have a good time, you know, chat with a few friends, and then get back on the wheel, and it's a pleasant evening. In the dunk tank, you're swimming for your life. We then take a look at the brains of the guys we put in the dunk tank and the guys who had free access to the wheel, and what do we find? The guys who had free access to the wheel, again, had all the neuronal growth that was supposed to be going on. The guys we put in the dunk tank, destruction of the neurons in the hippocampal region. We saw not only no growth, but we actually saw regression. We saw destruction, neurodegeneration in those regions. So stress, that is non-volitional exercise, running from that bear every single day, all day long, isn't a good thing for you, whereas volitional exercise is. So it's not just about exercise, it's about the, the kind of exercise that you're getting. It's about the perception you have about the exercise. But all of this is about neural growth, and this tells us now in these early studies that neural growth did occur, and it also told us that neurodegeneration occurred also on an ongoing basis. This was brand new information just in the early 90s. So what do we see in both these diseases? We see an elevation of inflammatory factors in the central nervous system, and some of these factors, these are interleukin factors, uh, 1, 6, tissue necrosing factor alpha, and more importantly, what we see is a loss of gray matter, neurodegeneration when the brain is inflamed. All right? And I want to emphasize this over and over again. When the brain is inflamed, there is neurodegeneration. These are not benign diseases. Anytime you leave a brain inflamed, it degenerates. Neurotransmitters, uh, inflammatory. So basically the way the brain neurons connect to each other is that they don't actually touch. They get really close. And then a packet of information, in this case serotonin, norepinephrine, some chemical neurotransmitter gets sent from one axon over to the dendrite to a, of a, a part of another neuron. And that signaling stimulates the nerve and propagates the signal. Okay, so that's what goes on. And so you all know what SSRIs are, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as uh, Prozac and Zoloft. These are all things geared toward increasing the amount of serotonin in the system. We have other medications which are geared to increasing other neurotransmitters that we have found in the past to be clinically effective, though we've not quite understood why. There's dysregulation of serotonin and norepinephrine in all of these diseases. There's dysregulation of glutamate, which is the most abundant neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, uh, which is a stimulatory neurotransmitter. So as that thing gets turned on, your brain gets upregulated. Uh, so depression and pain are neuroinflammatory, neurodysregulatory, and neurodegenerative conditions. I can't say that enough and make, make that point more frequently. All of this, this co-occurrence of depression, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and chronic pain, I believe should properly be referred to as central sensitization syndrome. Okay? Different disease than pain alone, different disease than depression alone. This is a unique disease unto itself and needs to be treated accordingly. 